I guess I'll start off. My name is uh, Baba Mudu Baki, um, and I'm super happy. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Super happy to be here and to present and share in the land of Oak Town. Uh, we call it a sister city because I think we got the same vibe, the same, you know what I'm saying, strong, strong liberation vibe. And uh, just happy to be here. I feel like I'm at home. But um, I'll start off. My name is Baba Mudu Baki, and um, I consider myself an advocate, a worker in this mushroom space and in the sacred healing space for our people. Um, my work started off um, under the tutelage of uh, the great Ahati, or as some know him as Baba Kalindi Ee. And so um, in regard and respect of the ancestors, I always like to share and, and give him and his acknowledgement. As a student of Tamarian Institute, this is where I garnered most and a lot of my sciences and where I learned effective organizing, you know, amongst other, you know, babas and elders in the community. So um, I'm trying to figure out visually, are we going to see the slides or do I go through? Oh. Okay, okay. So anyway, we'll, we'll fill in, but uh, my grandmaster, Ahati Kalindi, um, I first met organizing as a youngster, you know, in the streets of Detroit, you know, uh, trying to make a change for the liberation of our people. And um, in this regard, um, he, was my, he was my baba. And he taught me the ways of growing from a young man, young lion, to a, to a, to a, a warrior. And part of that dealt with um, his construction and uh, development of a martial arts institute. And so um, in this martial arts institute, we dealt with traditional African martial arts, which many people didn't think existed. Um, luckily for Baba, well, lucky, unluckily for those who didn't believe him, he had to prove it. And so we, we uh, garnered an institutional understanding and a reputation throughout the country as uh, providers of authentic African martial arts systems, techniques, and culture paradigms. And so with this, I always salute in the tradition of my ancestor, Ahati Kalindi. Any errors in my presentation regarding the science is due solely to me and not the instruction of my teacher. Um, and so with this, I start in the quote, okay? But the quote that I always live by, um, one was, be bigger than you are now. This was always something that he impelled us to do and be about bigger than what we currently are. Always think beyond who we are, push the paradigm beyond this existence that they told us we have to exist in, this current paradigm as we called it. And then the second motto was don't run from the darkness, run into it. Because it's a very deep spiritual concept, I won't get into it, but oftentimes it is those things that they teach us to fear that our salvation lies in. And part of the psychological trick is to get us to fear that which may be beneficial and a key to our liberation. Um, so uh, me and Baba, uh, I was under his tutelage. He, as a founder of a couple of African, well, as a co-founder of several African-centered schools in the basement of his martial arts institute. So I give salute to, uh, let me make sure I'm saying it right. Um, okay, let me make sure I'm saying it right. Ile Mode, the Shule, Marcus Garvey Academy, um, and others. We were part of a national network of African Center Shule's, um, CB, Council of Independent Black Institutions, before, you know, Dr. Umar, we were putting it down for 35 years hardcore, uh, starting the youth off with meditation, walking through the gardens, martial arts, then math. But anyway. <laughs> and um, made sure their lunch came from their hands and from their garden. So this was the type of paradigm that I was existing under, straight liberation work. And so as a, a young martial artist, I inquired about, <clears throat> as we moved and elevated in the system, the ultimate system, the ultimate level of engagement, and he told me it was in the unseen realm because it's the unseen realm that defines our behaviors in the physical realm, our limitations and our potentials. So if we expand that unseen realm, we expand the realm of our physical applications. And so that was the initial base work of what we started. And so that's how I started in the work of uh, dealing with mushrooms. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, the name of this presentation is the She Shot uh, Redemption, Goddess of Memory and History. Now that's one of the smaller so-called deities of Kemet, but she was a very powerful one. She was considered the daughter of both uh, Ma'at and Toth, as we know, um, Ma'at was the one who brought balance and also um, set the structure of the universe where Toth was the writer or the creator. She served as the timekeeper 
she made sure that in the essence of the mystical realm, time was accurately recorded. Your deeds were accurately recorded and your functions were accurately recorded. So that's why I call it She Shot uh, Redemption because um, in the psycho-spiritual world of Kemet, there was no disconnect between what we call uh, the sciences and the spiritual. So in other words, if you were a judge, you have to be a priest or priestess. If you were going to be an educator, a doctor, it was priestly work. So there was no separation between those two. And so as a result, um, there was always a connection between um, spirit and function. So um, I'm just looking at my notes real quick, making sure I'm on point. So here we go, epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Uh, many of us have heard of it, but uh, I like to go into it and how it relates to She Shot. Since She Shot was the uh, mystical writer of time, um, it also represents the mystical lineage of your land, of, of your family line. And so she was also the one that recorded who your family was in terms of your karmic debt and everything else. So epigenetics is the study of organisms caused by modification of gene expression other than alterations of the genetic code itself. So I hate to read it to you, but basically what it is is, of course, we're born with a set of influences from our parents, but then within those influences come environmental influences. And those environmental influences shape our offspring and also our current function. So epigenetics is new, okay? Um, oftentimes we talk about heritage and traits and things of that nature. Epigenetics is the flexible part of who we are. And so uh, we're gonna get into a little bit of the science but I really want to tap into the spiritual aspect, but in order to time together in the, in the priestly tradition, we, we have to start it off with the science and then we'll tie it in with spirit. So we can hit to the next slide. Um, and so this is a little complicated, but it's not really all things simple. Um, what we're going to be talking about potential, uh, particularly are histones and methylation. Uh, histones, for those of us who know, um, are basically, to put it simply, uh, the binding wrap um, that goes around your DNA structure, which holds it together. Uh, your methyl group are the tags or the identical markers of your DNA, which gets expressed. Okay, and so if we can just remember, it's almost like um, squeezing a dough of uh, Pillsbury uh, instant dough. You know, you pop it open. And so depending on how tight it's squeezed or released, it depends the, the expansion of the dough. Okay. And so um, to put it basically, this is the prevailing theory of how our DNA works. Now, um, so those histone tails you see, that is responsible for the squeezing and the expression of your methyl group, okay? So for instance, we have a, someone in our family line that may or may not have passed from, let's say drowning, okay? In that episode of drowning, there's a genetic, um, there's a squeezing for lack of a better word, or that histone group, which, which basically uh, kind of fixes the DNA to, to, to express itself a certain way. A marker comes out. Let's say they have a near-death experience, they have offspring. When their offspring are born, the genetic histone or way it squills and those in the genetic binder markers that are up indicate that, that original fear of the father or the mother. So that child has a natural aversion to water based on that previous DNA experience. Now, the beautiful thing about epigenetics suggests that those markers can be turned on and off. And so that's one of the things that's exciting in the realm of psychedelics because as they look for these things which turn those off, the most um, on or off, the most promising things are psychedelics, particularly the mushroom. Um, and so what I'm trying to do here, y'all excuse me, because I'm trying to sync my notes here because I have a lot of information I like to share and I don't want to miss any of it. So just give me a second here to queue up my slide. All right, so um, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> epigenetics was first discovered in labs um, dealing with the behavior of, of course, lab mice. And what they found was that um, they gave a particular uh, toxin or something that affected negatively the expression of this uh, mouse. And they found that four or five generations down, the same negative association or marker was found in their genes, okay? And it led to certain dysfunction, as you see, mitochondria uh, dysfunction. Had nothing to do with the behavior of the current mice, 
but it had everything to do with that initial experience. And so scientists started on something. They said, wait a minute. So if this mouse is affected by that, something that happened four or five generations back, how can we reverse that? Is there a way to reverse it? And what they started realizing was that, well, this mouse is in the same settings and conditions as their foreparents. They're in the same laboratory conditions, eating the same food. So of course those genetic markers would do what? Turn on. And so this, was, this started a branch of epigenetics when they started saying, well, what if we put this mice into different environmental settings? What if we gave them sti different stimuli? And so those two things, they started to find that the next generation had those receptor sites or those, those expressions turned off. Okay, so we can move to the next slide. All right, uh, the, meat, the meat of the matter, uh, the black community. And when I say black, I'm talking about diaspora. I'm thinking as all sun-kissed children, mothers, brothers, sisters of Africa, you know, regardless of our hue, this is what ties humanity together. So when we talk about black, we talk about the indigenous world and cortisol and the issue of cortisol. And some of us may be familiar with it, but cortisol is a stress hormone. And so oftentimes when we hear about things like diabetes, you know, hard bl blood pressure, all of these uh, issues with our health, they often blame what? Culture, lifestyle, eating habits, basically attacking who we are. But the reality of the matter is it's much, it's much deeper than that. It's much deeper than you eating yams and watermelon and having high blood pressure because these things actually are good for you. But what is not good for you are the conditions we've been placed in. And so no matter what you eat, those, those expressive genes are going to come out. So what is cortisol? Cortisol is called the uh, stress hormone. Um, it's commonly known as stress hormone. It's a good thing, though, because let's say, for instance, um, you are in a situation of danger. It will release extra sugar into your bloodstream to allow you to move much faster. Uh, let's say you are in a situation of starvation or extreme cold or heat. It will re regulate your metabolism to hold on calories, i.e. fat. Uh, let's say uh, you're in a situation of brutality or some kind of rough existence where you have to deal with environmental issues. It helps reduce inflammation so you can keep it pushing. Um, and it also assists with memory formulation, which allows you to compartmentalize traumatic situations so that you can continue existing. So when we talk about cortisol, it's not necessarily a, a, a bad thing. It's a useful tool for our survival. But when you are put into an environment that constantly stimulates the release of cortisol, you start to see these uh, indicating behaviors or these bio indicators. OK, so I noticed. Um, this, this, this uh, display is partially obscured, but basically what we're looking at is the release of, uh, and I'm gonna have to read this, okay. Uh, Andreochromatography hormone. hormones, and that's the ACTH. ACTH is basically what creates the cortisol that goes to your uh, immune system. So whenever you are stimulated through the fight or flight mechanism, stress, micro stress, micro aggressions, your brain kicks in and releasing minute amounts of cortisol to deal with the stress, okay? Uh, me and Oye had the pleasure of linking up with a very uh, astute professor at Stanford, and he has a, a novel uh, concept that's being entertained now. It's called persistent traumatic stress environment. And this, this, this person realized that unlike PTSD where people go to war, come back with memories, when you have a people who live in a persistent traumatic stress environment, you had a constant state of releasing that cortisol, that adrenaline, those stress hormones. And so it has detrimental effects in the long term. And so this is why sometimes we see those, um, kind of those effects in our community more at hand because we're dealing with epigenetic wars and epigenetic wounds from three, 400 years ago, or 60, or 20, or five, you see? And so uh, without that knowledge, we don't know why we do this. We don't know why we flip. You know what I'm saying? When somebody plays the music too loud. We don't know why we trip, you know, when somebody does something else. We don't know why we're afraid of birds. You know, we don't know why, you know, you know, all these little quirks we have, we thinking this is just me, but sometimes we've inherited those and we have to do the research. Now, you know, oppressed communities, we don't often have the, the benefit of having, you know, three generations of historical data, do we? We may not know who or where we came from or what conditions we existed in. 
And so that requires what we call shadow work, which we'll get into, because sometimes we have to look at those behaviors that we don't see. And that's what shadow work is. We'll talk more on it. But we don't often have the benefit of genetic information to find out what great grandpa or what he went through or she or great grandma or auntie went through or any of that. And so without that knowledge, we have to be proactive in our approach. And this is why it's so important for our community, because um, one, we are we have amazing amount of traumatic expression just by the conditions of health and everything else. Two, um, we have no real ancestral bank of knowledge to identify those contra behaviors. So we have to become citizen scientists, right? And so us becoming knowledgeable of these plants and how they impact the human physiology is liberation work. And so that's the reason I'm talking because I'm usually a macro dose guy. I'm usually a 10 to 20, 30 gram guy. But I also understand that um, the reason we got started and the reason we put this work out here and the reason um, Kalindi started this was a liberation work to liberate our people from the oppressive chains. And so when you take macro amounts, what you're doing is you're shifting the paradigm of the universe. You take micro, you're taking a change in the paradigms of your inner universe. See what I'm saying? So this is advanced spiritual technology we're talking about. Um, we move on to the next one. Just the understanding of how cortisol affects the body. Um, <clears throat> if it's overstimulated and it's not released properly, we see all of them. I won't read to you, but I'm sure we recognize all of these, right? And this is the stress hormone, you know, excessive hunger, right? Depression, hypertension, chronic fatigue, migraines, tunnel vision, tunnel vision. I know we deal with that a lot, right? Family, friends, community and role as a whole. So these are cortisol, these are contraindicators. But sometimes we blame each other, right? We blame cuz for tripping, and it really ain't cuz. You know what I'm saying? But we have to learn how to deal with that, you know? So we'll move on to the next slide, please. All right, how do we deal with this shit, right? We drink, right? Sometimes we try to sleep. We try. We try. We get it when we can, but it doesn't often get adequate, right? Sometimes we eat wrong. You know, we stress eat. And then we get the heart. We get the callus, right? We're like, nobody cares. Work harder. I'm on my grind. That's where we get our ice grill, right? That's where we be like, had those anthems about grinding, I, I sleep when I die, and all that bullshit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like self-abusing, you know what I mean? Like work harder, mule. But that's something we've been taught, correct? And then of course, party and bullshit and party. You know, when we see those effective things we can do, and we kind of like put them in the blind sight, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, man, you could have changed that tire last week, bro. You know what I'm saying? But you're gonna wait till it go flat, right? You know what I'm saying? So these are ways that we kind of mitigate stress. And then all it does is end up getting us another flush of cortisol when that damn tire go flat, right? So we just got to mitigate that. Finally, self-isolation. You can't see that, but sometimes we isolate ourselves. And we can isolate ourselves in a room full of people, right? You know, with that, like, what up, though? How you doing? I'm good. You good? Yeah, I'm good. What you up to? Nothing. Chilling? Yeah, I'm cool. The hell did that mean, man? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> But we kind of, you know, do it what we can, you know. But when we ask those piercing questions like, tell me a success you had today, you know. Tell me something that pissed you off. Tell me a challenge that you overcame. Now we, we start peeling away layers. So now part of this work deals with changing of our what? Linguistic coding, right? You like, you have an attitude like, I feel some kind of way. It's like fifth grade and shit, right? Like, I'm feeling some kind of way, you know what I'm saying? No, I don't know what the hell you're saying, man. You know what I'm saying? We're all guilty of it though, right? So part of this healing deals with surgical wording, the ability to use proper wording. Yo, man, I'm feeling kind of vulnerable in here, man. You're like, what's going on with the security? You know what I'm saying? As opposed to like, yo, man, these motherfuckers front might have to, you know what I'm saying? That's important because precise wording can help prevent a lot of drama, correct? So that's one of the major things we've been taught, a bastardized language, and that's the beauty of hip hop. We create our own language to work. So anyway, we'll move on. Now I say not just black folk. Now I know you're like, what is this? This is a global situation, like the colonial cage we in, y'all. That, um, that map you're looking at, that's a map of what we call gross domestic product. 
And that's the concept that every year, your country, your, your community, your civilization has to produce a little bit more. And where are you gonna get more from? The planet, others. Ideas of exploitation, you know what I'm saying? This is the current economic model for so-called Western and European civilizations and so-called liberated black and brown civilizations. But we were taught by those same colonial civilizations, right? So we're like, yeah, we produce, you know, 82 megatons of corn. Next year we do 83 megatons, but where are you gonna get the resources? And then five years from now, you're trying to produce 90 megatons of corn, what, you're just gonna produce more, more dirt? You see what I'm saying? So, of course, living in a backwards mentality, we're all encaged in this thing, you know? And so when we talk about this work of microdose and we talk about this work of sacred plant medicine, we talking like revolution for real because we're talking about uncaging minds. And once you encage minds, you encage bodies. You see what I'm saying? And so the reason I'm going here is because we know in the psychedelic community, it goes back to that party and bullshit model. Like people will have a hell of an experience and be like, oh, and then they'll cross with their group and be like, oh, this shit is great. But then you don't holler at cuz, you don't holler at big brother, you don't holler at mama, you don't holler at them people that's really suffering. You know what I'm saying? Yo, this is new to our community, right? So we can't follow the trends of the larger, richer, whiter, wealthier community who may have the luxury of saying, yo, we get together, man, and trip out on the beach and shit and play the guitar, which is dope. But at the same time, you know, auntie got a drinking problem. You know what I'm saying? Bro just came back from two decades in prison. You know what I'm saying? So we got to be a little more functional in how we do this because we get the beauty out the experience, we get the enjoyment, we get the, you know what I'm saying, insight, the wisdom, and the power to heal our own selves, but it's about time to heal the community. You know what I'm saying? So that's the basis and the thesis of what I'm talking about because I'm, like I say, I'm the first one to be like, give me 20 grams, close the door on the planet, I'm sick of y'all, I'm out of here. But, but it's a balance, it's moderation in all things. Moderation and even moderation, right? Most, most, most traditional cultures, we cool just right there, because most traditional cultures have already created means of dealing with this. We talk about advanced social science that has been buried for 500 years. Like, like traditionally, like to be honest, modern society is like social retards. We have no social, no technology, you know? I'll just give you an example of social technology. Like when you go to Africa, right? Like in traditional societies, depending on how a woman ties her skirt, Wears her head wrap, what jewelry she wears. You can tell if she's single, married, with children, an elder, or grandchildren. So what does that prevent? Disrespectful incursions, correct? And same thing for the men. And you can tell what guild they work in. Oh, you, you're in a warrior society or you're an educator. You're in the business sector. This is advanced spiritual technology they took from us, right? You know what I'm saying? We all wearing the same logo. We don't know, you know, I see my, my brothers and sisters out here. I don't know what y'all are about. You know what I'm saying? hope to love and learn more about you, but we had technologies to deal with a lot of these ills of society. And so these plants help us recognize and rediscover that. And that's why we get so much creativity out of these experiences. We come out like, yo, I got this dope idea because we're trying to create disruptive technology. We're not trying to keep this paradigm going. We're not trying to make it go any smoother. We're not trying to add oil to the machine. We're really trying to add like sand to it. Break the crank and then build another machine. That's reconstructionism. So we look at these traditional plants. We talk about ethnobotany, right? Ethno meaning a particular group. Botany, that plant that grows in the area. What's dope is about every, every elk cultural group has their own ethnobotany. You know what I'm saying? And so understanding that, yeah, there's some, there's some gems and weed and morning glory right in your alley that might do some things. You don't have to go to South America and burn out the forest. You know what I'm saying? Or you don't have to even burn out the forest of, of, of the Cameroon with Iboka, you know? You could become that understanding of the plants within your flora and fauna. But I'm a mushroom man because mushrooms are what? Bioavailable. It's like you can't run out. I, I don't think so. Anybody ever heard of that? No. Anybody ever heard of like having to poison tracts of land or cut down trees for some mushrooms? No. No, you use old trees, right? You know, so these are bioavailable things that are sustainable to the planet and they don't depend on raping the planet or another culture's expression, you dig? So anyway, but these are plants of traditional cultures, you know? And so 
when we talk about microdosing, all of these can be utilized in microdosing applications. I'm talking about mushrooms in particular, but Iboka mushrooms, you know, the peyote or the morning glory can be utilized, but we're not gonna go there because we're talking about citizen science. These are plants that are just being re-columbus or rediscovered, right? So we need to figure out how we use them traditionally and how we can apply them. Because some of these can be used synergistically. Maybe, maybe not, right? We talk about the Syrian rule, the black seed, or the harmaline as an MAO inhibitor. What other plants do we use traditionally and how can we apply them? So that's what we're talking about. The answer is under our feet. All right. Uh, and so I'm going to continue on. Now, when we're talking about the dope shit, and I curse, I'm hip hop, I don't give a damn. <laughs> so, you know, that's the blessing of my generation, right? Uh, dope science, microdosing, psychedelics. Why we call it dope? Because it's all about dopamine, right? Dopamine is that chemical that makes us enjoy and make life worth living. So we all dope fiends. Whether you roller skate, right? Whether you paint, sing, you just getting high on dope, dopamine. So your question is how you getting high, right? You might smoke crack, which is not the best way to get your dope, right? <laughs> or you can write lyrics. That's a better way of getting dope, right? You know what I'm saying? So it's the dope shit and understanding the science of dopamine. Y'all familiar with Dr. Carl Hart? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? Responsible drug use for adults. Check it out. Because it's amazing research by this brother who just shows you that, yo, the concepts of, that we've been taught, right? Like, yo, this, this is unnatural, you know. I mean, unfortunately, unfortunately, nature gets high. I have a, I have a whole lecture on that, how birds and monkeys and elephants. But anyway, um, <laughs> what I'm saying is that we've been seeded with concepts of, um, of, 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 I guess, neurocolonialism, where our states of consciousness are considered, there's a right kind of consciousness and a wrong state of consciousness, you know what I'm saying? And so understanding how your brain works, how dopamine works, how microdosing works is important. Also for this discussion, dealing with so-called drugs and how we're going to repair those who might be imbalanced and overusing those drugs. OK, so we're going to get into the actual how it works and when it works. Um, next slide, please. All right. Um, man. OK, so this slide is kind of obscure. So what you're going to see now, what we're looking at are. Um, you know, basically uh, dendrite synaptic connections of the brain. And so um, when we take traditional psychedelics, what we see is a, um, a, a, a reception of a particular molecule, you know, in your neuro, you know, you have, a, you have receptor sites in your brain that accept these molecules that allow you to have these experiences. And so part of um, modern drug culture, or yeah, I call it drug culture, prescription drug culture is the, um, issuance of SRI inhibitors, right? They try to inhibit the serotonin receptors which limit your ability to go there, you know? And so also impacting your sleep which also impacts so many other things. But what happens when you take microdosing is <clears throat> if you are not, if your receptor sites are not blocked and if you're not uh, laden with, you know, too many pharmaceuticals, these psychedelics will go to your receptor sites and then they will um, start to um, rewire your brain. And so on the other side, you'll find that your brain has a default mode network. There's a way that your brain operates. A, 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 a fly flies on, lands on your forehead, what do you do? You smack it, right? That's default mode network. And you're taught this because it's survival. You're taught how to survive. Once again, when you're living in a stressful environment, a colonized environment, you're taught to take up ideas, actions, and behaviors which pattern your brain. So your, our frontal lobes are designed to deal with stuff. Oh, I'm disrespected, just roll on. That's urban existence, that's how we deal with it. We just get it or we deal with the person, right? So there's a hardwired connections that we have. So when you take psychedelics, it causes those connections to rewire. Like, yo, here's a third alternative. It's not A, B, it could be A and B. And so when you microdose over time, your brain starts to say, well, maybe I'll turn left today instead of right. Maybe I have an apple instead of a Twinkie. Maybe I'll do some sit-ups instead of watching TV. This is when the brain starts to rewire itself and this is the magic of microdosing. Now, um, there are different schools of thought. Some people feel it should be sub-perceptible. Like, you take it, you don't feel anything. You just don't realize, like taking Tylenol or something, you don't necessarily feel it. 
Other people feel you should have a slight sparkle. That's up to debate. Once again, those citizen scientist things, right? Some people say, man, I don't feel anything. It's not enough for my microdose. Other people say, well, that's the goal. So you can move about your day without getting too distracted or talking to the tree, right? <laughs> Which is dope, right? But you might have somewhere to go, you know? So we don't want to get caught up doing that. But this is a, a realm of microdosing that we're exploring. So there are people who generally the microdose goes from, uh, I would say, 0.1 to 0.3, and there are people who take more of a gram, okay, mixed with some other neuro-enhancing agent, whether it's uh, Bicopa or it's uh, Osclawanda, which I always have a hard time saying, uh, niacin or things, lion's mane, right? These are all potential alchemical mixtures that can help change our brain chemistry. But what microdosing does in particular, it opens up those receptor sites and cause that inner engineering to go on while you still go to work, you know, work with the youth, do what you have to do. And then you can go in for the macro dose. That's when the big engineering goes in. That's when you're knocking the walls out and putting new countertops in, right? So we move to the next one. Next slide, please. What are the benefits? Um, we talk about the benefits of macro dosing. And once again, these are mostly anecdotal because science is slow on this work. I'm not going to say slow, but they're reluctant. And so a lot of this research is coming from groups, organic groups, you know, who do the work, who do the research, and sometimes they work with academia to get results. But this is a lot of this is anecdotal from real people on the ground, okay? So improve focus, and these are things that are across the board, everybody can agree on. Improve focus, reduced anxiety, self-efficacy, physiological enhancement, i.e. you start to just feel like taking a walk, you know? Uh, improve mood, reduce symptomatics, or reduce symptoms, creativity, and the social benefits, of course, allows you to come out your shell, cognitive benefits, you start to be much more creative. You might dust off whatever your creative pursuit is before you start working that nine to five trying to survive. Um, you also get improved energy, and so all these things lead to an improved quality of life. Now, not to be biased, but you see this is obscured. So microdosing challenges most of which are um, dealt with because of our social conditioning. So when we talk about the physiology of microdosing, there are no perceived physical challenges. But what the challenges are to this point are like perceptual, I mean like socially engineered challenges. In other words, uh, you may have what we call uh, self-interference. And self-interference is a situation where you'll say, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna I'm call my cousin and, and make up for that argument. No, the hell with that. You're interfering with the process. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes you'll have what you call uh, anxiety because you, you find yourself thinking out the box and it's like, I don't know, I just don't feel right today. Something's different. Like, I didn't wanna hang with the fellas. I felt like doing something else or I didn't wanna, you know, that's once again conditioning. Um, you may have physiological discomfort, and that's that when we talk about that debate between subperceptible and perceptible, because people who microdose often don't go in a microdose. They don't have the five to seven gram trips, and so they may take 0.3 a gram, especially if they're especially sensitive psychically, and they'll be like, I feel something, and that, that's not pleasant to somebody who's not familiar with the psychedelic space. And so that's something you need to consider when you deal with microdosing. You know, who are you dealing with? Are they familiar with the psychedelic space and are they able to deal with that? All right. Um, the big one on here. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. It's fine. I'll go back to it. Just a few more. Um, illeg illegality, okay, which is something that we're fighting. And this is important. We do citizen work because the more of us that's in this work, the harder it is for them to quash it. And the more of us that's involved in this movement to decriminalize, because we're not trying to create another uh, money model like cannabis. Maybe some of us are, but not most of us, right? We push to decriminalize, and so we can do this without the threat of legal oppression. Um, and one more is would be an impaired mood, because you'll find yourself outside of your normal box. So you may be a little more silly, or you may be a little calmer, or you may be a little more animated, or you may be a little more talkative, which is something that you're not used to, which may cause other reactions from people around you. And you start to think, what's going on, but understand that change is happening, okay? All right, taking the helm, non-passive process. 
Um, a lot of people think microdosing is like I can take a microdose and continue my bullshit behaviors. Not really. Um, the purpose of <laughs> microdosing is to understand that it's not to cover up, it's not a damn band aid to cover up the pains in your life. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, oh, I can't stand my coworker and uh, me and my neighbor got real issues, so I'm gonna take a microdose so I can deal with it. No, that's not what it's for. <laughs> it's to re engineer those situations. So it's not a passive situation where you just use it to like, like numb yourself from whatever deal, reality you're dealing with. And matter of fact, what it's gonna do is bring it in a greater focus, it's gonna become a greater nuisance. So don't avoid the inevitable. Let the inner engineering go and, and make those proactive choices. What does it say? It says lots of people, and I love this, it says lots of people use their initiative because no one told them to, right? That's a pun on words. Because people need, an, people have to be told to have initiative, which is, which is a shame in itself, right? Lots of people never use their initiative because no one told them to. But what we say, Oye, when you, when sometimes you microdose, we say, ooh, I have visitors, right? That plant knowledge will tell you to if you don't have it internally. So that's the beauty of microdosing, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, how do we, let's, let me see. All right, now, how do we take initiative? Um, active visualization is important. We all understand the importance of what you see and the ability to manifest the reality in front of you because that's what we're doing. We're creating reality on a plank level scale, like faster than the speed of, of light. It's, it's a deep concept. But we're creating reality as we live it. So, I'm sorry, can we move to the next one? I don't, I know, we, I don't know how we are on time. So, okay. All right, so another thing we do is um, we shadow, shadow work. And when we talk about shadow work, shadow work is, I define it as the edges of your luminance, right? Like we all have brilliance, we all have light, we all have positivity, but we all have limits, right? That's where you find your shadow. See, I'm looking at it like an allegory. It's like when it's 12 noon, can you see a shadow? No. So you gotta go to, sometimes you gotta go to dark places to see your shadow. What does that mean? Like those places that you avoid, because that's where you're going to see those behaviors you don't see. Like we have behaviors we don't even know. You know, like you may walk up to a, a friend and you'd be like, oh, man, yeah, I like your, you know, I, I like your little outfit. And you don't even realize you just did a microaggression. Right. So we have habits that we don't we're not recognized and we're not necessarily intentionally doing it. So shadow work is part of this microdosing work, too, because there are behaviors that we don't see. You know, you say, OK, that's 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 the last donut. Right. It's shadow work. So that's important. Um, and it, it, it's a whole science of shadow work. So I encourage you to look into it. Um, exercise the rage. We have rage, man. We in an oppressive situation. Everybody should be pissed off. And if you're not. <laughs> You, you know, and accept that. Don't, don't, you know what I'm saying? And if the people around you ain't enraged, that's their fucking neural balance and imbalance. You know what I'm saying? Because this is unnatural. Now, is it okay to just stew in the rage? No. What do you do with the rage? You use proactive solutions. So that's like I say, when you microdose and you go, or macrodose, you find ways to proactively deal with the situation. You don't like the pigs? Okay, they're oppressing you. You didn't know the police got insurance? Yeah, call the insurance department. Ooh, nobody want to cover a liable um, police department. You got to think out the box, though. See what I'm saying? And this is what these mushrooms do, especially for the small, small, small towns. They got, like, private insurance. So you be like, yo, your people going to get you hit for, like, a couple mil. They will drop them like hot potato. This is like one of them organizing tactics, you know? But these are something our ancestors learned through creative going into these spaces. You know what I'm saying? Um, Exercise the rage. Get your knowledge yourself. Understand who your original mo mother root culture is. Like modern spirituality is rooted in like pagan, Madame Blavatsky BS. And I'm going to tell you why. Tell you a little story. Tell you about a cat named like uh, P.B. Randolph. Uh -oh. Pascal Beverly Randolph. It's real history. So after the Civil War, there was this black guy, right? Pascal Beverly Randolph, gun runner, abolitionist, just like straight up. And he was a spiritualist like for real spiritualist, like leader of all world lodges spiritualist. I mean like all world lodges. Straight from here, P.B. Randolph. I'm talking about, you know, like remote viewing, telekinesis, all this stuff. 
he was proving he was doing it. And the problem was, it was like ABC. It was like, yo, bro, let me show you how to do it. Do this, do this, do this. And it's like working. So then here come one of his students, Madam Blavowski, one of his early students. And she was like, yo, this is dope. The problem is we can't make no money off of this. How are we going to make money? And so that's when she got with her homeboy Mesmer. Mesmerized, get it? You know, and that's when they start like knocking on the bottoms of tables like, I see your husband, you know, and you know, having magnets float shit across the room. Excuse me, y'all. It might be those people. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, anyway, Madame Blavowski took this message on the road, her and Mesmer, and started this age of new spiritualism. And that's when they start pimping the game out. And that's when people start turning over their life fortunes to like have people read and shit. And it was advanced psychology and advanced like uh, hypnosis they were using on people. And so they, uh, this real history, you know what I'm saying? The day of his death, Madame Bavowski was like, oh shit, the nigga's shooting at me with rays. She was in the middle of a seance. I know this is, do the research. She was in the middle of a seance. And she said, oh, the nigga's shooting at me with invisible rays from the afterworld. I swear to God, this, this is in history. So like when we talk about new age science, you know, a large amount of it is hustle. I'm sorry to say that, but it's a lot that's real, and we got to cut the bullshit from the real. That's why you get mesmerized, man. Mesmer was the shit. He was pimping everybody. But anyway, I'm not going to go there. That's why we need knowledge of self, right? right. Knowledge of self will lead you to the wealth. Anyway, check your gut. That's the last point. I wouldn't, keep on the slide, please. But check your gut. In other words, your second brain is just in your gut. This is like your functioning brain. This is like stand up, sit down, belch, open the door. You know, functionary. This is where the feeling area goes on. You know what I'm saying? This is where uh, I'm, not, I'm not understanding what you're saying. This is where the thinking goes on. So if your gut microbiome is off, not only is your life existence off, your psychedelic experience is off as well. You know, advanced spiritual science. So this is why, like, you go to South America, they have you eating yaka and other things to get that, that, that right bile going in your stomach so you can get the experience. What are the plants we need to eat? Anybody know? It's something we need to research, right? So that when we go in, we can change our brain from our gut microbiome, change that, do that DNA structure from how we eat. And then also when we go into these spaces, we can, like, do the permanent switch ons and off. So... Um, so this next slide, and this is, uh-uh, I'm sorry, real quick. So this is what my personal research and focus is on, and this is like in a theoretical. If you can just go, yeah. So everybody, I don't know how many people are here familiar with mushrooms, but this is just a side note. Um, one of the major, the fruiting body, the body, the actual body of the mushroom is mycelium. It's the invisible white um, cellular base structure that grows in the soil. And that's also uh, responsible for sequestering nutrients. And also, some people call it the internet of forest, you know. And so, um, let me put my disclaimer out. This is the theoretical musings of Mudubaki, all right? So, you know, one of my theoretical musings, because I'm all into brain science, is that um, our brains and our nerves are coated in this thing called the myelin sheath. Okay, the myelin sheath is a, um, a fatty white uh, neuroprotectant in this, uh, in this slide here that coats our nerves, okay? In times of stress, sometimes in, in intense stress, your myelin sheath may break, and this is what causes things like uh, multiple sclerosis or sometimes neurogenerative diseases because it's like having a break in your electrical line, right? And so our, our, our brains are coated like in this myelin sheath, and I see a very close connection between that and mycelium. When we talk about like synergistic, synergistic like similarities because they have similar functions like distributing key nutrients through the brain, making sure the hemispheres of the brain, connect, making sure the nerves fire properly. And so one of my theories, and, and it, now let's go to the next step. When we talk about these right here on the uh, next slide, these are what you call microtubules. And I don't want to get too far out there, but microtubules are the 
the stored information inside each neuron. Now, everybody's scared of like the modern computer age and saying, oh, AI is coming because they have AI computers uh, operating at 10 to the negative 25th power. And they're supposedly faster than anybody because they can beat people in chess, but they can't feel and they don't have any meaning of why they're playing chess in the first place. Anyway, um, <laughs> the newest research indicates this is a guy named Stuart Hammerhoff who's like the leading authority on human consciousness. Um, with, within the neurons, we have these things called microtubules. And microtubules, um, what he discovered is not only, when they discovered the operating capacity of the human brain, they were looking at neurons at 10 to the negative 24th, but this guy's research indicated that they were only looking at the capacity of one neuron. So that means their understanding of AI is a trillion times less powerful than the human brain. Real talk, a trillion times. Because they were looking at the power output of one neuron, but one neuron has these microtubules. Which, input, which impacts to 10 to the negative 60 computing power, which means we have massive untapped potential. And so through this purposeful rewiring of the brain, who knows what the, what the potential is, right? So this is why I'm geek, because we're citizen scientists. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I know enough about neuroscience, I know enough about mushrooms to cross it over. And I don't, I don't know how many neuroscientists know about mushrooms. So boom. I'm a, I'm a node, right? <laughs> All right, uh, we'll move to the next slide. All right, and the final slide is the why behind the what. Why are we doing this? It's not a get high movement, y'all. Like I say, this is uh, what kind and not would stop. And the reason we say that is because um, when these plants were first online, 30, 40, well, not first online, when they were Columbus again, um, they were quickly put back underground. And the reason they were put back underground is because of irresponsible behavior. You know, hippie fest. You know what I'm saying? Exploitation, sexual exploitation, psychological exploitation, creation of cults, you know, financial exploitation, political exploitation through the CIA and MK Ultra, things of that nature. So we can't let this go back. This is the ammunition for revolution, y'all. When we look at every uprising, of oppressed people that actually work, you will find the use of these sacred plant medicines. Yes, we hear about Toussaint in Haiti, but nobody, nobody talks about Bukman, the plant man, right? Nobody talks about Grandy Nandy, the lady that gave the plant medicine to the warriors, because that's the secret sauce to the revolution. When we talk about uh, Cuba, when we talk about the uprisings in, in South America, we talk about the use of these plants to empower, embolden, and give vision and insight. This is why when colonialism started, the first head they chopped was the what? Shaman. Once you do that, it's a wrap. You have no orientation. This is how colonial, this is col colonialism 101. Take out the spiritual aspect. Take out their connection with the divine, and they're lost. So the why behind the what is movement building for black, brown, and guess what? Oppressed white communities as well. Because there are millions of people all over the globe who've been oppressed. This is all part of your you know, corrupt priesthood that want to keep it illegal and everything else. But I'm not gonna belabor it, because I get the cue. But I appreciate uh, the time, and I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but, um, oh, we do, okay, bet. So thank you very much for your audience, and uh, we're gonna be presenting more on this topic. You know, and so I'll open up questions, comments, or concerns if there are.